I'm Maria, and you're about to watch a video of a message that was preached at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, our mission is to help people take their next step with God, and we pray this message helps you do just that. Good morning. How's everybody doing? You guys have a good Thanksgiving? Eat a lot of food? It was awesome. I had Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving because we thank God uh, for everything that he's done for us. We have so much to be thankful for. Um, for the food, obviously, and um, I thank God because uh, uh, we see family, and sometimes we see family, and we're like, man, I love them so much, but if you stop and think about it, you probably love them that much because you only see them once a year um, at Thanksgiving, you know, you have like that aunt and uncle that you see like once a year, la tia abuela, that smells like Bengay, right, <laughs> you only see her like once a year, you know, and then you see cousins that you only see like once a year, and speaking of cousins, my wife's cousin is getting married and my wife is one of the bridesmaids right and um that's all fine and dandy until the day that my wife tells me like hey we're going on a trip for two nights all the bridesmaids and you know and i'm like uh because all i hear is you're staying home alone with three kids all right that's all i hear and so the day finally arrives and my wife is getting ready um to leave and uh guess what the last words that come out of her mouth are Babe, the only thing that I ask when I get back is that the house isn't trashed, all right? It's not, I love you. It's not, oh, I hope you have a great time with the kids. You're going to be okay. Have fun. None of that stuff. Please make sure the house isn't trashed. You know, it's as, as if I had some reputation for trashing things, right? And, um, and so the only way that I can guarantee this is by making sure that as soon as the kids wake up, we're not there. All right, so I'm like waking the kids up, all right, let's get dressed and let's get out. And we're out for the whole day, all right. I had the whole day planned out. We went to parks. We went and got ice cream here. We went and ate over there, and everything was like on the other side of town. And so we had lunch in Miramar, and then we went to a park in Miami Lakes, and then the kids fell asleep in the car. And so I drove to Dayland Mall, all right. And so I'm just making sure that I have them strapped and tied down legally as long as I can. And, uh, and we just spent the whole day. We went and got pizza. We walked around Main Street. And then we got home at around 9 o'clock. And as soon as I opened the door of my house, I smell this thing that smells like death. I mean, my house smells horrible. And I'm thinking, like, what did I do? Like, what? And I'm thinking, you know, what, my boys are disgusting. Maybe they took a poop and they left it in the toilet, didn't flush. It wasn't that. We're, like, looking all over the house, like, 30 minutes, trying to find where is this smell coming from. Because mom is coming in a couple hours and the house smells like death. And so, finally, I get to the boys' room and it's their turtle tank. All right? And it smells horrible in there. And all I could think was, no, I felt like Luke Skywalker, all right, when he found out that Darth Vader was his dad. I was like, no, because was this, what this meant now at 930 at night is that I had to take the turtles out of the thing, clean the turtle tank, go outside, all right, and that's what I had to do. I'm, I grabbed the tank, and I'm walking out of the house with this turtle tank with their two turtles in the kitchen, like, let me see, can I touch it? I'm like, listen, I'm going to drop this thing, get away from me, all right, and so I go outside, and um, it's dark, it's pitch black, and, and I take the turtles out, I put them in another container, and I dump all the water into the, uh, the sewer um, drain in the middle of the street. I hope that's legal. If not, I'm incriminating myself. And so I did that, and, and then I go to turn the hose on, and the hose in my house usually has a nozzle, and so I found out very violently that it didn't uh, that night because I turned the, the water on, and now I'm all full of water. I'm completely soaked, and I'm praising God as this is all happening, and... and uh, <laughs> And so um, I finally clean everything, and I clean the rocks. I put the dumb turtles back in the thing. I'm walking into the house, and the kids are like, let me see the turtle, let me see the turtle. And I'm like, I'm going to drop this, please. All right, and so I get to the room, and I put the turtle tank, and then it's the next thing. I had told them we were going to all sleep in the bed together, and we were going to watch Karate Kid, right? And so they're like, oh, we want to watch that karate movie that you like, because they've never seen it. And so I'm like, please, I'm all full of turtle water. I'm all soaking wet. Let me take a shower, and then we'll watch the movie, and we'll have a good night. And so... Finally, I was in my bed. We all fell asleep. We watched part of the movie. And then the next morning, I had asked my mom to come over to help me with the kids so I can get to church. It was a Saturday night. Now, Sunday church, I have to be here early. And so my mom walks in, and she goes, Marquito, dejate la puerta abierta. Mark, you left the door open. I'm like, what do you mean? The door was wide open when I got here. And I'm like, Mom, whatever you do, don't tell Leilani. Don't tell my wife. My wife just found out about it in the first service as she was in the, in the church. And, uh, 
And I'm like, I have no idea, Mom. I told her the whole story about the turtles, and the kids were driving me nuts, and I must have, like, forgotten. You see, I missed that. I closed the door and walked in with the tank. No, I just walked in, and the kids attacked me. So I left the door open. And um, thankfully, you know, the angel of the Lord was protecting my house, and nothing happened to us. And um, so I'm getting ready to go. My mom's with the kids, and I can't find. This story's not over. I can't find my keys, all right? And I needed the keys to open the gate to go outside and clean the turtle tank, right? So I can't find the keys anywhere, and I'm looking for the keys, and I can't find that I'm going to be late. And, and I, I grab my spare key to my car, and I leave, and I'm like, Mom, I really need you to find my keys. they got to be here because I had them when I opened the gate. They're somewhere in the house. And uh, she looks and looks and looks. She misses the service that she's supposed to come to. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I'm still looking for your keys. Finally, I see her in church, and I'm like, you found the keys? She's like, no, I didn't find the keys. I'm like, you have to go back. Take one of my six sisters with you and, and tell them to help you find the keys. That's why I have so many sisters. And so they went to the house all day looking for the keys. And they couldn't find the keys. My mom's on her hands and feet outside going through the garbage. And my son goes to my neighbor's house, rings the doorbell and says, hey, John, have you seen my dad's keys? And John's like, are these your dad's keys? John had found my keys like at 5 o'clock in the morning when he was walking his dog out in the street somewhere. And, uh, and my, it took an eight-year-old boy to go and knock on my neighbor's door and ask him for my keys. You see, this happens to us as crazy as this may sound. This happens to us all the time. We're looking for something, and the answer's right there. We don't see it. How many times in your life have you lost a pen or a pencil, and you're looking, going crazy, looking for this pen and this pencil? Where is it, in your hair or in your ear? You know, I had already even called a locksmith to find out what it was going to cost to rekey the keys in my house, the keys to my car. You know, we have the tools sometimes to do something, and we think that the tools that we have aren't adequate. This happens to us with our relationship with God. We read the Bible. We come to church. We hear about all the things that God can do in and through our lives. And we say, yeah, sure, that may work for him, but not for me. God may be saying, here's the answer to your life, and we're looking somewhere else, and the answers are right there. Or we think it doesn't apply to me. I don't have what it takes. In Matthew, Jesus says, come to me, and I'm going to make your life easier. However, we always seem to complicate things a little bit more. See, if that's you today... If you're here and you've asked the question, how come God does this for them? How come God can use him this way or her that way? Or maybe you think you don't have what it takes or someone told you you don't have what it takes or you've tried time and time again and you failed. Let me tell you something. It's okay. Jesus loves you and he's going to do great things in and through your life. And today you will leave this place with the assurance that you are called of God and that he has an incredible plan for your life. And why do I know this? Because he did it in my life. And he did it in the life of the guy that we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about and we're going to look at the life of Moses. In the message, in a message that I've titled, How Can God Use Me? See, Moses had an immediate reaction when he came face to face with God. When God told him, I am going to do something great in your life. His immediate reaction was probably very similar to the reaction that we have when we hear that God wants to do something in our life. Moses was confused. He didn't know what to say. And Moses had a bunch of questions just like we have questions. And let me just bring you up to speed to the life of Moses. Where is Moses at this time? I know a lot of you have seen the movie, you've seen the cartoon with your kids, but here's what's happened in the life of Moses. From the moment that Moses was born, Moses was running. Moses was an Israelite. He was born in a time where the children of Israel were captives. They were slaves in Egypt, and Pharaoh noticed that the Israelites were growing strong. They were big, and he was scared that one day the Israelites would be so strong that they would take over the Egyptians, all right, and, and break free. And so Pharaoh does what he only could do is, and he... Um, made a decree that all the boys had to be killed. And so Moses is born into this madness, and his mom puts him in a basket. You guys know the story. He floats on the, on the Nile, and the Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and she takes him in as her own. And so Moses lived the first 40 years of his life in the Pharaoh's palaces in Egypt. He was at the top, at the center of power. And then in frustration over the fact that the people of Israel were held captive, in that nation, and he couldn't do anything about it. He was frustrated because he couldn't change it, and eventually he murders an Egyptian in this frustration. And in fear of what would happen to him, 
he goes out into the desert, okay? He didn't go to some resort in the desert, to desert springs. He went to this desert called Midian. And in this desert, he spent 40 years. He was a shepherd for 40 years. He worked for a man named Jethro. Eventually, he married the boss's daughter. He's set to inherit the family business. He's got this perfect little life all planned out. And he can see the future all laid out for him. And then he runs into a problem. He runs into a bush. Not George Bush or Jeb Bush. He runs into a burning bush. And look at what the Bible has to say in Exodus 3, verse 1. It says, one day Moses was tending to the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in a bush. Moses was amazed because the bush was engulfed in flames, but it did not burn up. That moment changed everything in his life. God got his attention. It changed every single thing in his life. And you and I are probably never going to trip across bushes that don't burn, okay? But let me explain something to you. What this burning bush experience is, this is what's happening in Moses' life. A burning bush is when in the midst of your routine, this is just a common old bush. There were hundreds of it all around it. Moses had probably walked in front of this bush a thousand times. Actually did the math, and if he lived 40 years in that desert, he walked in front of bushes just like this 14,600 times in the morning. And in the midst of the routine, he was surprised by God's invitation. What made this bush extraordinary was the fire. It was God's presence at the center. God's presence changes Things. Say that with me. God's presence changes things. God's presence changed what was happening in Moses' life that day. It caused that bush to catch on fire. It causes our lives to catch on fire. God does something in us when he is in the center of our life. And look at what happened when Moses began to approach this bush. Exodus 4, Exodus 3 verse 4 says, When the Lord saw that he had caught Moses' attention, circle that, caught his attention, that's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to catch our attention just long enough for us to be able to hear what he wants to do in our life, what he wants to change in our life, the way that he wants to breathe life into the darkness that exists in some of our hearts. See, when the Lord saw that he had caught Moses' attention, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Don't come any closer, God told him. Take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. I think the amazing thing is the first thing that Moses heard, it was his name. It was something very personal to him. Who do we love more than ourselves? No one. We all love ourselves. We all love the sound of our name. This is a personal experience for Moses. God wants to do something in Moses' life that only God can do. Moses hears this great thing that God wants to do, and now he has some questions. He wonders, how is this going to work? How is this going to work out for me? He's asking the same questions that we may be asking when God says, I want to do something great in your life. Today you may be asking one of these four basic questions that Moses was asking. And the first one, he's like, who am I? Who am I that I'm so special? Who am I to do this? How can I do this? In Exodus 3, Moses, but Moses protested to God. Now he's protesting. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Moses was saying, right, God, how am I going to do this? I'm too ordinary. I'm not qualified for the job. And the truth is, if God asks you to do something great, and all you're thinking about is yourself and looking at yourself, you're not qualified. See, you're always going to be too old or too young or too skinny or too fat or too hairy or too bald. You're always going to be too heavy or too light or too something to do something great for God. Moses says, I can't do this. Who am I? And God had an answer for Moses to encourage him in the midst of what he was facing. He was hearing a knock. He was hearing God call his life. He didn't feel adequate to answer that knock, to respond to the call of God. See, a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Halloween. We probably had over 1,000 people that showed up here at Calvary for the event. And some of you didn't come. You missed out, all right? You stayed home and probably did your thing. You probably went and egged the house of the HOA president, all right? But most of you just handed out candy, right? I hope, as the kids were knocking on your door. And let's imagine if about halfway through that night, you ran out of candy, and all you know is that there's a bunch of kids that are coming by, 
And at that point, you have two options. One option is you go grab some sheets, poke a couple holes in it, and you go get candy, go trick-or-treating yourself, get candy from your neighbors, come back, and now you have candy to pass out. I see some of you, like, elbowing the person next to you, and that's what you did. All right? The other option is what most of us probably do. Um, you turn off the lights. You make sure that they can't hear you. You tell the kids, be quiet, don't talk. They're going to knock on our door. We're going to pretend that we're not here. And when somebody knocks on your door, you don't go to the door because you have nothing to give them. See, I think a lot of us feel this way when it comes to our relationship with God. We see him invite, we hear him knock and say, I want to do something great in your life. But the truth is we feel that if we went to the door, we would have nothing to give him. We would have nothing to offer him. So why even open the door? Why even respond to the calling of God if we have nothing to give him? We don't want to embarrass ourselves and we feel that we're going to embarrass God because God's saying, I'm going to do this in your life. And you're saying, God, I have nothing to give you. Exodus 3.12 says, God told him, I'll be with you. That was God's answer to him. You have nothing to give me, but I'm going to be with you. This is how you are going to do it. Moses faced that feeling and God had an answer for him. The amazing thing to me is that God could have built Moses up. God could have told Moses, who are you? You're the guy that grew up in Pharaoh's household. Who are you? You're the one that understands the government in Egypt more than anyone else on a personal level. There's no one better than you. Who are you? You're the best guy for the job. But instead of saying that, because he knows that that wouldn't be enough, he says to Moses, I will be with you. And that was enough. He didn't point to Moses' qualifications. He pointed to his greatness. He pointed to what he could do. He said, I will be with you. Some of you need to hear God say that to you right now. You're going through the greatest transition of your life. Everything is changing. It's all up in the air. Maybe God brought you here today, and all he wanted you to be here for is so that you can hear, I will be with you. Some of you are going through the greatest problem in your life. It's never been this tough before. You're wondering, how am I going to make it through? How am I going to wake up another day with the strength to make it through? And God brought you here today to say to you, I will be with you. I know some of you are feeling God tapping you on the shoulder. He's saying, I want to do something in your life. And you're not sure what it is, but God wants to do something in your life, and he wants you to know that he will be with you. I love the way Psalm 91 says it. When you call on me, I will answer. I will be with you when you're in trouble. I will save you, and I will honor you. That is a promise of God that he will be with you. See, in the end, it's not your ability that matters. It's your availability that matters. It's not what you can do, but that you tell God, God, I'm here. Use me. When it comes down to it, when God asks you to do something, it doesn't matter if you don't have what it takes to do it. It doesn't matter if you lack ability. It's that God can do it through you. You see, a lot of times, the people that God can use the most are the people that know that they can't do anything. They know that they don't have any special gifts, and they just offer what they have to God. And many times, God can't use some of us because we think we know it all. We think we've studied so much, and we've gained so much, and we have all these accolades, and we know so much. And God is trying to work through our lives, and he can't work because we get in the way of what God wants to do. See, maybe that's you today. God wants to do something in your life, and you just need to step aside and allow him to work. Moses he knew a lot of things, and he could have very easily been qualified to do what God is calling out of his own merit. But it was when he allowed God to use him that God was able to work in his life. It's your availability that matters. That's what makes the difference because God will be with you. No doubt about it. God is more able. He will be with you every step of the way. Last week, I went to Disney with my family. I brought a picture. Um, it was my niece's Amanda's birthday, and so we're a bunch of us. It's a whole it's, it's a miracle that they didn't shut Disney down that day, and we all got along and stuff. It was a lot of fun. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to go, besides being with all my sisters and stuff, was because I wanted to go on Star Tours because they had changed it up, and they had put some of the Force Awakens in there and some of the stuff from the new movie. So I really wanted to go. I wanted to go with my kids. I was super excited. And um, uh, my four-year-old Stella, who's awesome, and I brought a picture of her just to show her off because I love her so much, and she's so cute. And, um, and she'll write anything at least once, right? 
And so we're getting ready to go on Star Tours, and she's scared. And she says, Papi, I'll go if you sit with me. All right? And that's exactly what God says to Moses. I'll be with you. All right? I could have easily told Stella, Stella, you're brave. You can do it. Look, this is the ride. You go in there. When you walk out, I'm going to be right there. I could have done that, but I didn't. I sat with her. I held her hand. When she was scared, she hugged me, and I told her, baby, it's going to be okay. The ride's almost over, and we made it, and she loved it, and she was okay because her dad was with her. God is with you. And you'd be thinking, who am I? God will be with you. That's when Moses starts. After God says, I'll be with you, the second question is pretty obvious. It's like, okay, God, you're going to be with me, but who are you, God? Who are you? That's the next question. If you are going to be with me, excuse me for being doubtful, but who are you to give me strength? And God gives him a real simple answer. It's two words. He says, I am. That's his answer. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 13 and 14, it says, Then they will ask, which God are you talking about? What's his name? What should I tell them? And God replied, I am the one who always is. Just tell them. I am has sent me. See, Moses had to be thinking, that's really going to help. I am? Could you at least finish the sentence? I am what? Moses had to be thinking, God, like, they're going to laugh at me when I tell them, I am. What does this mean? Give me something else, God. And I am is actually one of the most powerful statements, one of the most important names of God. But what does it mean? And what God was saying to Moses is, tell them this. Tell them that I am the one who will meet their needs. Whenever a need arises, I am the one that will meet their needs. And you know why I know that? Because in the Old Testament, God uses this name over and over and over again. This I am. You see, when the children of Israel, they needed provision, God said, I am your provider. Jehovah, which means I am. He said, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider provider. When the children of Israel needed victory in their lives, victory in their nation, what did God say? I am your victory. I am Jehovah Nisi. When they, when it came for a time when they needed peace, peace in their homes, peace in their lives, peace in their land, what did he say? I am your peace. I am Jehovah Shalom. When the, when the need came that they wanted to know that God was there, how many times have we wondered, God, where are you? You know what God said? I am there. Jehovah Shammah. He's there for you right now. See, each time that someone had a need, God gave them a name that fulfilled their need. A name that met their need. I will meet your need. That's what he says. I can meet your needs. In a world where we always say, I wish. I wish I had this and I wish things were different. You know what God says? I am. I am the one that can meet your needs. You see, there's this issue, and and we doubt. Sometimes, man, we're going through temptation. We're going through struggles. We're going through difficulties in our life, and we're like, God, I really need you to do this. Or or we need to take a step of faith, and, and we're wondering, is God going to provide? Where is God? And this robs us from the blessings and the victories that God wants to give us. See, a few months ago, we took our kids to the pediatrician for their annual checkup. All right, and this is usually like the biggest drag ever because you're in the pediatrician's office forever, and then they pinch the kids and tap their knees and hear their heart, and then you pay the deductible and you're out, and the kids are like, you know, running around and, you know, playing and doing all this crazy stuff, and then there's all these other sick kids around you, and you're thinking, my kids came here, they're not sick, they're gonna leave sick, right? And so that's pretty much the way it went, and we just do it by age. So the oldest goes first, and the second one, and then my little Stella that I showed you a picture, and the doctor's checking her out. And then he's listening to her heart, and he makes his face. And then my wife's a pediatric nurse, and so she sees his face, and she realizes something's up. And so she says, tell me, what's up? And he says, "Uh, I heard something I don't like. You got to take her to a cardiologist. And, you know, I'm freaking out like a typical man. And and, um, so we make an appointment, and, you know, cardiologists, they're very accommodating. It was like five weeks for the next appointment. And so, you know, we're waiting, and for five weeks, I don't sleep. I'm, like, freaking out. I'm, like, people are asking what's wrong, you know, and I'm just, like, you know, something's wrong with my baby. And I'm praying, and I'm asking God, God, what's going on? 
you know. And then it's like the day before the appointment and this hurricane that was going to like flood the, the, the state of Florida is coming. And, you know, the cardiologist was in Miami. So everyone that works there is Cuban. And so they closed the office the day before because everybody's got to go to Sedano's to get 50 gallons of water and all the Vienna sausages that they can carry, right? Because that's how we survive in a hurricane, if you don't know, those of you that aren't Cuban. And, um, and so, you know, the hurricane doesn't come, and you'd think the office would open. But, no, the office is closed, so we got to make another appointment. So here I am, like, dying. And so finally, I'm like, let's just go to another cardiologist. We get the appointment, and we're there. And, um, you know, we're waiting. And finally, the cardiologist sees Stella. And then he looks at us and says, she's fine. The EKG came back, and she's fine. And I started crying. And I was so happy, and I believe that God healed my baby. And you know what I learned in my life? I learned that every time a need comes up, God meets that need. He doesn't show me the way that he's going to do it. He doesn't show me this beautiful path on how all the victories that are going to happen. Just every time the need comes up, he meets that need. If you wait for God to figure out all of your problems and show you the way, he's figured out all of your problems in your life before you take a step of faith. You're never going to take a step of faith. I guarantee it. You just realize that he's given me enough to start. He's given me enough to wake up and go. And the miracles will happen. Watch as they happen. They will happen when they need to happen, at the time that they need to happen, one at a time. That's how God does it. You know what happened with those five weeks, almost like two months waiting to hear that my daughter was okay because I had to go to a specialist who went to school for like 12 years to find out that my daughter was okay. Man, my relationship with God grew stronger than ever because one of the most precious things in my life I felt was going to be taken away from me. I mean, just a year ago, a person that we knew died, a little girl, because of a heart problem. And I'm thinking, am I next? Is it going to happen to my little girl? And in that time, my relationship with my wife, with my God, with all my kids, I would wake up at night and just pray over my kids. I would have never done that if I would have never gone through the situation in my life. If I would have known that that doctor was going to listen to her heart and put a bunch of cables all over her body and tell me she's okay. If God would have said, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. Where would I faith? We need to trust God. And when God says, I am, God will meet our needs that's God's answer. I am the one who can meet your needs. The third thing, what about them? What about that group that I'm going to? What about these people of Israel that I'm going to talk to? They might have some questions. The Bible says in chapter 4, Moses protested again. Look, they won't believe me. They won't do what I tell them. They'll just say the Lord never appeared to you. He's almost saying, God, I have to, I have to be a little difficult here because I have this bad feeling that I'm going to go and I'm going to say, God told me to set you free. And they're going to say, how do you know that God told you to set us free? And he's going to say, well, there was this bush and it was talking to me. I mean, could you imagine, God, this isn't going to work. It's going to go downhill from there. Imagine if I said, hey, I'm here today and you know what? Your life is going to be great and God's going to bless you. And the reason I know this is I was talking to this tree in front of my house all day yesterday. You'd be like... Uh, yeah, right, Mark, you're crazy. This is exactly what's happening in, in Moses' life. And he had this feeling that they were going to reject him. This invalidating feeling for 40 years. He'd been in the desert, and he'd been remembering that he tried to set them free. That's one of the reasons he left Egypt, not just because he was going to get arrested, because they didn't accept him. They rejected him. And so he's walking back into that fear. This is huge. You know, it's this Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Syndrome. What are all the other reindeers going to think? What are people going to think when I get back? See, my seven-year-old, he's getting to the age where he's embarrassed to give me kisses when I drop him off at school. And so I walk him to his classroom, and I, for as long as I've been taking him to school, he'd always give me a kiss. Sometimes he'd remind me, Papa, you forgot to give me a kiss. And now when I go to give him a kiss, he's like trying to like, for me not to kiss him. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, Papa, can you just kiss me in the car? And I'm like, no, I want to kiss you in front of your class. And so I start kissing him all over his face. And he's embarrassed what his little friends are going to think. See, you're probably not seven, but man, we make so many decisions in our life based on what they are going to think, what they are going to say. It's amazing what they keep us from in our life, what they think. 
They might reject me. They might ignore me. They might ridicule me. They might not accept me. The thoughts of they are huge in our lives. Sometimes it's even people who are gone. It's people who moved away. It's an old boyfriend. Maybe it's a parent that's died. All right? And whenever we hear someone say God wants to do something in your life, there's a change that God wants to do in your life. There's something big that's going to happen in your life. You hear this voice that says it'll never work. It'll never happen. You're paralyzed by these fears of what they might think, what they might do. See, it's easy for me to talk about this, but it's very difficult for us to break free from the thought. It paralyzes us to think, to, to even like consider what other people are going to think. You see, many of us have lived with this for years. It's kept us from fulfilling our dreams, from fulfilling the call of God in our life. And how do you break through that? And here's God's answer. Exodus 4.2, it says, And the Lord asked him, What do you have in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. That's God's answer. God's saying, What do you have in your hand? You can see what God's doing here. God is saying to Moses, Get your eyes off of them and look at your hand. Get your eyes off of the unknown and look at what is known. Get your eyes off of what might happen or what they may say and look at what I can do in your life. Look at what's in your hand. God's taking familiar things and he's using them to take care of Moses' imagined fears. But Moses has something to do so that this whole thing works out. God says, Moses, what's in your hand? And I want you to place it in my hand. See, you break free when you realize that you can't give God what you don't have. You don't need to worry about giving God what other people have. You can do all that you can do, and that's the only thing you can do. And let's let God do what only God can do. When we make the choice to give God what's in our hands, we break through some of those fears. That's all we can do. Stop looking at what your sister did, what your brother did, what your friends have done, the talents that they have, the things that they have, and look at what's in your hand. In verse 3, God said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it down, and the staff became a snake. Moses was terrified, and so he turned and ran away. And the Lord told him, take hold of its tail. Moses reaches out, and he grabbed it, which I think took a lot of faith to grab the tail of that snake. But he took it by the tail. And it became a staff again. And what's going on here? Why is God doing this? He's saying, Moses, take one of the most familiar things in your life. It's the most familiar thing to him. It's something that he carried with him every single day. Take that most familiar thing in your life, the most ordinary thing in your life, and make it available to me. Watch what I can do with it. It was a snake, and Moses picked it up, and it was a staff, that simple stick. Moses is going to hold that stick across the Red Sea, and the sea will part. Moses is going to take that staff and put it in the Nile, and the Nile will turn to blood. The Bible tells us that he strikes a rock, and water comes out of that ordinary thing. God is saying, this is what I can do if you would just trust me. Something amazing happens when you and I look at what's in our hands. And we say, God, it's not mine. It's yours. It takes care of the fear in two ways. First of all, you realize it's not yours anymore. It's also God's. And if they have a problem with it, they have a problem with God. It's not just me against them. All of a sudden, I've partnered with God and it changes the whole relationship. It's no longer what they're going to think about me. It's what are they going to think about God. And let me tell you, God is a lot more, he's a lot stronger, he's a lot more powerful, a lot more able than they are. God wants to do something incredible in your life, and all you need to do, he's not asking for anything more, is to look at what you're holding on to. You see, so the obvious question is, what's in your hand? I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, you need to give it to him. It might be some ability, some talent that you're holding tightly onto it might be a relationship you're in a relationship right now that's keeping the work of God to happen in your life and God is saying open your hand and hand it over to me I want to bless your life maybe it's a step of faith in your life what's in your hand 
Maybe it's a failure. And you're holding on to that failure, and that's your crutch. That's your excuse. Whenever someone says, hey, why didn't you do this? Why, why, why did you do that? You're saying, oh, because remember, I failed back then. That, that's when I failed. God wants that too. It might hurt, but then it's going to feel so good to know that God could even take the times that we've messed up and use it for his glory, use it to help others. Sometimes those things that we're holding on to were handed down to us by others. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's just, you know, our family. And, and we hear this all the time. That's the way that we are. We're angry. We're alcoholics. You know, we're, everyone in my family has been divorced. Everyone in my family beats their kids. Everyone in my family talks this way, acts this way. That's what you're holding on to. And that is what's keeping you from being set free. That is what's keeping you from helping others to be set free. That is what's keeping you from breaking that curse that's been following you. And you think that God turning that stick to a snake would be the end of what Moses had to ask God, but he isn't finished. He saved the biggest thing for the end. And he tells God, now how about this? See, this is a big thing in his life. I can't serve you because of this. I can't do what you're asking me to do because of this. This is the big smoking gun. He says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. And not, and not now, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Do you see now Moses is kind of blaming God. You're talking to me and, and look, I, I'm, I still can't speak. I get tongue-tied and I love what God says to Moses. I mean, it's incredible. It's simple. He says, who makes mouths? You think that I don't know what your problem is? You think that I don't know what your failure is? Moses felt handicapped. See, there's all kinds of handicaps. Some of you may feel handicapped by, by your past. Some of you may feel handicapped by your education. Some of you may feel that, man, your, your emotions and your age and, and your health, it's keeping you from doing what God wants you to do. And God is looking at you today and he's telling you what he told Moses. Who makes mouths? Who made you? Who created you? The Bible says in the palm of his hands. God knows our needs and he wants to meet our needs. He's aware of our handicap, but he wants us to be aware of his strength. God wants us to be aware of his ability. God's answer is, I will help you. God is aware of our shortcomings, but he also wants us to be aware of his power. God is aware of our shortcomings. And who doesn't have shortcomings? We all do. But he also wants us to know that we can be overcome and overwhelmed with his strength. When I was a kid, I had a strong calling of God on my life. When I was my kid's age, seven, eight years old, I knew God had called me to be a pastor. All right? But as I grew up, as I grew older, every time I would tell someone I want to be a pastor, they'd make a weird face. All right? And then when I became a teenager, people said, hey, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. And I was running from that calling of God on my life. And then I remember one day I sat with some Christians that I really looked up to, that I, I felt they were going to set me free. And I said, hey, God wants me to be a pastor, and I don't know where to go to school. I don't know what to do. And they said, hold on a minute. That's all cute that you want to be a pastor, but you need to have a career. All right? You need to go to school and get a career in business or get a career and be something with your life, become a doctor. Do, and then you could serve in the church. Look at all the people that serve in the church. What about God providing all my needs according to his riches and glory? Do we forget about that? And I spent like four years of my life studying. I got a degree in political science. And I wonder sometimes, this keeps me up at night. Where would I be today if I would have just obeyed God? And praise the Lord, I'm standing here today and I finished what God called me to do. But forget about even if I would have still been in this very place. What about all the money that I just flushed down the toilet, man? I could have been sponsoring missionaries, doing incredible things for God. And I was disobedient yet God had mercy and I tell you the story today don't waste another day doubting what God can do in your life don't waste another day God is calling you and God wants to do great things in and through your life so your question today is probably how can God use me we learned it make yourself available 
to God. Isaiah says this, here I am, send me. If you feel God calling you to do something, just say, God, send me, use me. I'm going to trust you. Listen to God. Even more blessed are those who hear God's word and guard it with their lives. God wants to bless you, but so many times, just like Moses, we have all these excuses and all these things that we don't hear the voice of God. God is calling you today. I'm going to invite you to stand up. We're going to sing a song, and I believe that God is going to do a work in our lives today. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's going to do a work in your life today? I want you to say that with me. Say, God is going to do a work in my life. The third thing that you need to do is you need to step out in faith. You need to take a step of faith and say, God, whatever it is that you call me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to open my hands and I'm going to lay it before you and you're going to do a work with the things that I have, with the gifts that I have, with the failures that I have, the things that I'm holding on to. And you know what's awesome? If God wants to give you something, you have to open your hand. And God can't give us anything if we're holding on to the things that we've been holding on for so many years. And so I'm going to invite you today to open your hands, to come up here, and we're going to pray, and we're going to say, God, speak into my life. Where you call, I will follow. Whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do. And the awesome thing, just like Stella, when she went on that ride, her father was sitting next to, you, to her. God is going to be with you every single step of the way. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God's going to do a work in your life? So we're going to pray. And as we pray, I'm going to invite you to come forward. And God is going to do a work. Amen. All right, let's see. Come on, guys. Come up. And we're going to pray. And we're going to believe. God bless you. says this, if you grasp and cling to life on your terms, you're going to lose it. But if you let life go, if you open your hands, you will get life on God's term. That's what's happening here. God used one man to set the children of Israel free. Look around you. There's more than one person up here today. God's going to do incredible things in and through your life if you allow him to use every single thing that's within you. See, there's some of you here today that are giving your life to Christ for the first time. There's some of you that are rededicating your life to Christ. There's others of you here today that are saying, God, I want to give it all to you. I've been holding on to this thing because it feels good, because it's comfortable. It's like Moses' staff. I want to lay it at your feet. Use me, God, for your glory. Is there anyone else before we pray that's here today and you don't want to miss this opportunity? Maybe you're here with your wife, your husband, your friend. Just say, hey, can you come up with me? Can you pray with me? I don't want to miss this opportunity, this burning bush opportunity. Is there anyone else? We're going to pray. All right, they're telling me to wait. Amen. You will be set free, and the people around you will be set free because of your obedience that beautiful isn't that amazing let's pray dear God I thank you for this day I thank you for this group of people that's up here I pray God that you would start a revolution in their life 
in their heart and that it would overflow, God, and that people will be set free and drawn closer to you because of them, because of their obedience. We pray for children. We pray for husbands and wives and and family members and friends that are far from you. I pray that you would use them, God, to draw them to you, God. Lord, I pray for forgiveness. Father, I pray for every single person that has been holding on to words that were spoken to their life words that were said to them that you're not good enough you will never amount to anything you are a loser all these words that someone that they cared about said to them i pray that in the name of jesus today they will be set free god in jesus name that they would leave that here that they would leave their failure at the foot of the cross god and that you would begin to meet their need step by step thank you god we love you we pray for your forgiveness I want to invite everyone to pray this prayer with me. If you are here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer and the whole church is going to pray it with you. Say, dear God, I come to you today and I say I'm sorry for the mistakes that I've done, for the sins that I've committed. Forgive me. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. awesome if you pray to receive jesus for the first time we want to give you this book so as you go back to your chairs just check on the back of your connection card begin a relationship with jesus if you recommitted your life to christ i want you to indicate that on the back of your connection card so we can pray for you and help you along the way and maybe you're here and there's something that you surrender to god you need prayer you need us to get behind you and support you with this we pray the pastors at the church and the staff pray for every single prayer request and so if you have something specific that you need prayer for just fill it out on the bottom of your connection card we want to be there with you we want to help you along the way god bless you we hope you enjoyed the message if today you want to take your next step with god and give your life to christ please visit mycalvary.com forward slash begin we have a free gift for you we also want to encourage you to share today's message with all your friends and family and follow us on facebook and instagram from all of us at calvary God bless you.